I consider this extremely important, said Mr. Tesla. Light cannot be anything else but a longitudinal disturbance in the ether involving alternate compressions and rarefactions. In other words, light can be nothing else than a sound wave in the ether." End quote. Light makes different sounds. In fact, the sounds that light makes are incredibly gorgeous, and they seem to mimic living creatures and other natural sounds here on Earth. When I first heard about this, I was completely mind blown and wondered why I had never heard of this up until then. This journey we are about to take goes into the beautiful geometries of light and how it seems that sunlight fragments or filaments into individual sounds that make up some sort of protective layer around the globe that flows in plasma tubes around the earth from the north to the south poles. When we talk about light, we think of light as just visible light, which is only one tiny little sliver of the full spectrum of light. Light is actually indeed the full electromagnetic spectrum. In science, the entire electromagnetic spectrum is called light. And since light is just varying frequencies, it makes sense ultimately to call sound a form of light. You have the frequencies we can hear and the frequencies we cannot hear. Likewise, we have the frequencies we can see and the frequencies we cannot see. According to Hindu mysticism, light and sound is what composes the entire universe, and they have a name for it, the saniferous ether. Saniferous meaning producing or conducting sound. To begin, we start with a simple sentence, the sounds of the auroras. Yes, the northern lights that we are all so familiar with known as Aurora Borealis, and the southern lights, the Aurora Australis, actually make noises, as well as beautiful colors that we have all come to know and love. The Earth is continuously being bombarded by solar particles. When sunspot activity acts up and emits solar flares towards Earth's magnetosphere, the skies on the north and south poles illuminate with vibrant dancing colors. These particles also create very low frequency electromagnetic waves. This creates a natural type of radio which can be picked up by receivers. It's incredible to know that the Earth makes its own radio waves. The first known and documented description of the sounds of the auroras was in 1882 by British telephone operators, described as whistling and crackling sounds. These remained perplexing sounds until the early 1930s when some people started to associate these sounds with the northern lights. Even then, it wasn't until 2012 when Antu Lane of Alto University released the first recordings of auroral sounds. So this phenomenon is an extremely new discovery. Even then, I'm sure that these weren't the first people to actually hear the sounds of the auroras as there are ancient myths and legends surrounding the sounds themselves. For example, the Sami people, indigenous to the Nordic countries, believe that the aurora carried the sounds of their dead ancestors and must be treated with respect. It's considered wrong or taboo to whistle or sing in their presence. Otherwise, you might risk being whisked away by the lights, never to be seen again. The Guardian writes, and I quote, rare reports of crackling and whooshing noises accompanying auroras have traditionally been dismissed by scientists as folklore. But data gathered in Finland has shown that under the right weather conditions, auroras can be accompanied by noises. So without further ado, let's hear some of the sounds of the auroras. There are all sorts of different sounds to listen to that the auroras are emitting. Lots of them have different names as well. 
we will go through and categorize some of these sounds and compare them to some of the natural sounds occurring here on Earth. To begin with, we have the auroral chorus. Now, let's listen to frogs, more specifically, a type of frog called spring peepers. The sounds of the auroral chorus and the sounds of the spring peepers sound incredibly similar, almost like there is a mimicking or a mimicry that happens. As above, so below. Now, let's take a listen to this crackling static produced by the auroras. I will now compare this to the sound of crackling ice that is produced by an ice skater skating on thin ice. They are similar sounds, but correlation doesn't mean causation. That being said, I will describe some of these naturally occurring sounds. First, we have biophony. Biophony is a term introduced by Krauss, who in 1998 first began to express the soundscape in terms of its acoustic sources. The biophony refers to the collective acoustic signatures generated by all sound producing organisms in a given habitat at a given moment. So the frogs chirping would be considered a biophony. Then we have geophony. Geophony means non-biological ambient sounds generated by the natural world. For example, the sounds of wind, sounds of rain, thunder, and waves. This term was also originated by musician and soundscape ecologist Bernie Krauss and was constructed from the Greek geo, related to earth, and phone, meaning sound. So the sounds of the auroras would be considered a geophony. Light in the form of lightning obviously makes a sound that we are all familiar with called thunder. But did you know that this sound is also heard in the auroras? When listening to the auroras with specially designed receivers, every once in a while you'll hear a crackling sound, which is a lightning strike somewhere on Earth. And then shortly after this electromagnetic pulse you can hear an ascending and descending whoosh, which is called a hissy whistler. The geometry of this sound is incredible as it wraps way out into the Van Allen belts in the shape of a torus and descends from one pole and then bounces back and ascends to the other pole. The name for those who are lovers of thunderstorms is brontophile. Bronto is Greek for thunder and phile comes from the ancient Greek word meaning to love. And likewise, the condition of being afraid of thunderstorms is called brontophobia. Back to the sound of lightning. According to The Guardian, there are more subtle and less understood noises associated with lightning, known as brontophonic sounds, which are heard far less frequently. Brontophonic sounds sound like hissing of a red hot iron in water or the tearing of fabric. Thunder travels at the speed of sound and is usually heard several seconds after a lightning flash, but brontophonic sounds are perceived at the same time as the flash. One theory is that brontophonic sounds come from induced charge. The same potential difference that generates a lightning stroke may create smaller pockets of electrical charge in the surrounding areas. These may be strong enough 
at the instant of lightning to make crackling electrical sounds similar to static electric discharge. Brontophonic sounds are part of a larger category of electrophonic sounds, anomalous rustles and pops also associated with meteors and the aurora borealis, all of which remain essentially mysterious. So let's go back to the initial question. Does light produce sound? It is said that light does not produce sound on its own because it does not have a physical medium that it can create vibrations in. When certain types of light hit a surface, some of the photons are absorbed and their energy is transformed into mechanical waves that generate sound. Okay, so I've also heard that sound cannot be heard in a vacuum. So if you were in outer space and somehow you were able to scream, no audible sound would come out. According to mainstream physicists, space is a vacuum. Sound is carried by atoms and molecules. In space, with no atoms or molecules to carry a sound wave, there is no sound. There's nothing to get in sound's way out in space, but there is nothing to carry it, so it doesn't travel at all. No sound also means no echo. But then I found out about something called alphane waves. In 1942, Swedish physicist Hannes Alphane combined the mathematics of fluid mechanics and electromagnetism to predict that plasmas could support wave-like variations in the magnetic field, a wave phenomena that now bears his name, alphane waves. Northumbria University's Dr. Richard Morton and colleagues found evidence that the magnetic waves also react or are excited higher in the atmosphere by sound waves leaking out from the inside of the sun. The researchers discovered that the sound waves leave a distinct marker on the magnetic waves. The presence of this marker means that the sun's entire corona is shaking in a collective manner in response to the sound waves. This is causing it to vibrate over a very clear range of frequencies. This newly discovered marker is found throughout the corona and was consistently present over the 10 year time span examined. This suggests that it is a fundamental constant of the sun and could potentially be a fundamental constant of other stars as well. So what this article is saying is that not only does light produce sound, but that our very own life-sustaining light source itself, the sun, is producing sound. What's more is that alphane waves play a critical role in organizing individual elements into Birkeland currents through a process called Markland convection. So the sound of light literally self-organizes matter into filaments of tubes within tubes, like 3D cymatics. So what is it called when someone can actually hear light? Once thought to be a rare condition, some forms of synesthesia actually allow people to hear light and light flashes. According to Smithsonian Magazine, one in five people may be able to hear a flash of light. So I want to leave us with these last important thoughts pertaining to the importance of sound and the role of light in the universe, as well as creation myths around the world that believe that the creation of everything in the beginning was sound. According to JPL, NASA, aka mainstream cosmology or scientism, the question is asked, was the world created by sound? And their answer is, before there were any stars or galaxies, 13.8 billion years ago, our universe was just a ball of hot plasma, a mixture of electrons, protons, and light. Sound waves shook this infant universe, triggered by minute or quantum fluctuations happening just moments after the Big Bang that created our universe. And lastly, what role does sound play in some creation myths? The myths from many different cultures have always told us God created the world from sound, from music. Across the globe, 
there are creation myths which include music as one of the factors playing a major role in the creation of the world. In the beginning was the Word, according to the Gospel of John. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Genesis 1 3. Thus, speaking the universe into existence, implying that sound comes before light, or sound begets light. From the Vedas of the Hindu tradition comes the writings that in the beginning was Brahman, with whom was the Word, and the Word is Brahman. They state that creation arises from the first sound of the universe, the primordial sound um. The ancient Egyptians believed that the god Thot created the world by voice alone. In the Papal Va, from the Mayan tradition, the first real humans are given life by the sole power of the word. And there you have it. Sound produces light, produces life.